So hi everyone and welcome to this video on uh, illustrating the third degree price discrimination uh, theory that we discussed uh, in the last video as well as discussing a few uh, consequences of third degree price discrimination when it comes to societal welfare. So if you recall from the last uh, video, we said that the overall profit maximization condition, assuming that the monopoly segments its markets into two groups, requires that the marginal revenue that it gets from group one should be equal to the marginal revenue that it gets from group two, right? And that's equal to the marginal cost of production, which is equal, which is some function of the total output, which is essentially the output of one group plus the output of the other group. In that, we said that uh, the marginal cost is the same regardless uh, whether the monopolist supplies it to group one or to group two. And this condition implies that the marginal revenue of the last unit sold to both groups must be equal to the marginal cost of the last unit of output produced by the firm. And this further implies that at the maximum profit, we can see that MR1 okay, is equal to MR2. So this is a condition that we'll sort of play around with in this video. So before, in the last uh, video, which was on a monopolist, in the last uh, video, in the last module, we said that we could re-express marginal revenue as equal to the demand function times one o minus one over the elasticity, wherein the price elasticity here, okay, in our case, since there are two groups, could be for uh, group one or group two. So you have that price elasticity, and we know that that elasticity of price is always negative. That's why we take the absolute value of it. Now, the elasticity of price measures how sensitive consumers are to changes in the price of a specific good. In this case, the price of the monopolist's good. And at the maximum profit, we can see that the, uh, the marginal revenue, so this is essentially marginal revenue of group one. And this is marginal revenue of group two, right? So that's just this condition here. We're just implying that condition. And what we'll notice is for those to be equal, okay, um, so that equality must hold, but say um, the elasticity of uh, group two is greater than elasticity of group one, which means that the consumers inside of group two are more price sensitive uh, than the consumers in group one, then it must be that uh, for them to be equal, the price that is charged in the second group is less than the price that's charged with the first group. So that is the group with a less price elastic demand is charged a higher price relative to the group with a more price elastic demand, which makes sense because if a, person, if a group of people are not sensitive that much to price changes, if the monopolist wants to maximize its profit, it can charge a higher price without losing too much demand. So let's try to illustrate this scenario. So for simplicity, we'll assume linear demand curves. And as you always, we'll assume that constant marginal cost. So we have uh, this graph over here. Okay, and what we'll notice is Okay, we have a graph for group one and we have a graph for group two. And you'll notice that the demand conditions that they face, so their demand curves are different, right? Because again, group one's demand curve is different from group two's demand curve. And this also suggests that groups one marginal revenue curve is different from group two's marginal revenue curve. But what we kept on saying on and on was that the marginal cost to the firm, uh, whether it produces quantity for group one or group two, is the same. So marginal cost is that constant uh, orange line that you see there. So it's some constant quantity. So remember, the maximization condition is MR1 equals MC, that's for group one, and MR2 is equal to MC for group two. So MR1 equals to MC, that occurs here. So to get the uh, price, okay, we face it to the demand curve and we get the price of P1 and we get the quantity Q1, okay? And when we go for uh, for a group two now, again, same condition that occurs somewhere here, the price, okay, is somewhere here, that's P2, okay? And the quantity is Q2. 
And what we'll notice is we have that condition that we raised on earlier that P1 is greater than P2, right? Because the, uh, the group, uh, which is group 1, is less sensitive to price changes. Therefore, the monopolist could potentially um, charge them a higher price without losing too much demand and extract more profit since its goal is to be able to maximize profit. So uh, I think that graph simply shows how uh, third degree price discrimination sort of differs from your conventional two degree price discrimination or first degree price discrimination and by solely charging a single price. So it allows maybe or potentially some form of uh, profit uh, max profit transfer that occurs, uh, which is greater than if it were charging a single price. But we're not sure with that and we'll expound on that. So uh, there are two main welfare consequences to third degree price discrimination. The first is third degree price discrimination is certainly not as efficient from a societal standpoint as perfect competition or first degree price discrimination. And this stems from the fact that in both, uh, in third degree price discrimination, the price is always charged. The price that is charged for any of the groups is generally greater than the marginal cost. So if you notice this one, both P1 and then uh, is greater than P2, and both of them are greater than marginal cost, right? So both of these prices that were charged are greater than the marginal cost. And because the price is greater than the marginal cost in both markets, then there is some welfare loss in terms of deadweight loss in, the, in both of these markets. So that's the first main consequence. The second one is from theory alone, we can't tell whether welfare is higher if the monopoly uses third degree price discrimination or compared to if it just charges a single price. Because in both of these instances, uh, the monopolist will charge a price higher than marginal cost. So too little is produced relative to perfect competition. We, we cannot attain the output that we want okay, relative to perfect competition. And what happens is output may rise as the firm starts discriminating if groups that did not buy uh, when the firm charged a single price started buying. And essentially, this happens when the, uh, the closer the multi-market price discriminating monopolist comes to perfect price discrimination. And that happens when there are more groups. So say we don't have just two groups, we have four, eight, seven with different demand characteristics and the monopolist can so uh, can sort of uh, model each group properly that it can sort of extract the consumer surplus away from that and it would be uh, having a greater profit and potentially becoming more efficient because it's able to serve the market more. And this essentially increases output so the less the production inefficiency there is. However, Okay, unless a multi-market price discriminating monopolist sells significantly more output than it would have had it set a single price, then welfare is likely to be lower with the discrimination. So uh, that's it for our discussion on third degree price discrimination. In the next video, we'll discuss an example of third degree price discrimination using calculus and we'll move on to our lectures regarding oligopolies. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video.